Am I audible? Good morning, guys. Hello everyone, good morning and welcome to our second section of our webinar series. The title of the session today is uh, Computational Approach to Urbanism and the speaker today is uh, Architect Arshad. Uh, again, before I start, similarly to yesterday, I have a few pointers to make sure all of us note towards the entire session. And uh, first and foremost, I request all the participants to kindly turn off your videos and your audios throughout the entire duration of the session and also make sure that if anyone has any particular question related to the session, make sure that you can type in a direct message to the organizers only and we will take your questions at the end in a Q&A session. Before I start, uh, let me just get ushered on board. Let me introduce the speaker for the day today, architect Ashad. Ed Ashad, the principal designer of uh, Node Studio, is an experienced architect with a high degree of creativity and technical nuance. He has honed his skills with, uh, while working in deputy design led offices in the UK and India. Design rigor, technical detailing, and careful execution was demanded at a boutique practice like Munsing Enterprise in Chennai. Distinct at a large practice like Square and Partners in London gave him exposure to international projects. He has been with teams producing concepts and design schemes quickly to international standards and liaison with people across continents. Ashad also has a master's degree in emergent technologies and design with distinction from the AA School of Architecture London, where he was awarded the AA Foundation Graduate School Prize for Design. He has a particular competence in computational design and a passion for working on complex geometries. On behalf of uh, the Institute and the management, I welcome Ashad to session and over the session to him. Hi everyone. Am I visible? Actually, is my camera on? And is yes. it audible yes. enough? 
here you are okay welcome and uh, really thanks for thanks to everyone for tuning in so i'll be talking on computational approach to urbanism let me share my screen first um, yeah is the screen visible to everyone yeah yeah go ahead okay all right computational approach to urbanism cities are actually a complex system of networks and flows that mainly grow from bottom up says michael batty in his uh, book the new science of cities because uh, since the 1960s itself cities have been studied as uh, systems because of the multitude of elements energies and data that flow in and out and intertwine with each other sometimes city itself is called a technical socio technical being and there's just too much info to take in as input for urban design uh, at least for human at least for a human brain so that's where computation comes in with computational tools we can assimilate large quantities of data analyze and use it appropriately computational design is actually you can look at it like an adaptive framework through which dynamic solutions emerge and if the framework is sensible the output will be smart so we really need, do not need smart cities at least in the current sense of the word if our urban areas are sensible uh, at inception itself okay so today's presentation is structured in four parts So the first three parts will talk about the tools itself but i won't talk about software as per se but how these tools can be used in the larger purpose of urban design and this will help you to create a workflow so when we get to the last part i will show you more case studies uh, and talk in detail about my uh, master's thesis as well and about the procedural aspects of generating design and lastly if time permits i'll show you a few of my current uh, projects at new studio that are in the urban realm also do keep an eye out on the bottom right hand corner of the slides as i have written some credits or keywords for future future reference all right computational tools sorry so computational tools can be broadly classified as such you have uh, tools to collect data and analyze it and that's usually done together along with visualization of data then there are tools for prediction uh, generally uh, you know various simulations and projective modelings to create future scenarios and finally all of that info should help you form a robust framework to generate your design so this is how you should look at uh, to use those to, to use computational tools with this logic and just to be clear when i'm talking about tools this is how i see it data can be independently sourced from uh, websites uh, or apps like osm open street maps or google which has street maps and urban engine or satellite imaging sites etc then there are standalone expert tools uh, like Opted as CFD, which focuses only on wind analysis, or there might be tools which engineers or experts use, and we might just get information from these, you know, uh, these tools and data sets, and we need to bring it into a CAD platform of our choice, a CAD or a 3D platform where we can do further manipulation and integrate it into our design process. So my CAD platform of choice has always been Rhino and Grasshopper. because it's uh, super flexible versatile and there are lots of free plugins that help you bring in other data so tools for data mining we all have heard of the term big data with regard to cities and that encompasses a whole ton of information from uh, city infrastructure to networks to human interaction demographics etc we can gather all of that and use it to our advantage to get to know our context better so how do you get big data 
into uh, you know your 3D environment or your design process. ArcGIS is uh, the most common place to where this uh, data is already mapped. And uh, there are some really nice people out there who have created these layers of data sets and they can be downloaded for free as uh, shape files. Sometimes you might have to purchase it and sometimes like in India, data is actually quite scarce. So you might find some really varied uh, information like crime rates in different areas. They could have taken it from literally the number of FIRs filed in various police stations or uh, the number of complaints that uh, a particular electricity board gets in various uh, areas of the city. Such varied information can be obtained and overlaid. You can bring it into, uh, for example, in Grasshopper, you have uh, tools like Heron, Meerkat, etc., which help you bring in these uh, ArcGIS data sets as SHP files. And when you overlay it with your uh, physical information of the city, like buildings, streets, uh, and the city map itself, uh, you have n number of ways to to open street maps. Tools like Elf Mosquito uh, help you with that within the grasp of run. You don't need to sit and uh, uh, trace Google Earth images and CAD. Then social media these days is a big part of big data. We can take advantage of social media as the pulse of the city. Geotagged Flickr photos, Facebook posts that are geotagged, such data can be used innovatively. We can also track hashtags. Uh, the image you are seeing here is just uh, tracks the common routes used by people for jogging and cycling in the city of Glasgow. Um, I think there's an app called Strava which does that and you can track those that data as well. This is an innovative social media project by Good City Life, where they ask people to tag the smells and sounds uh, in the city of London. Uh, they would have probably created a specific hashtag for that purpose, where uh, and when people uh, in a particular street start hashtagging, say hashtag this smells like bread or dogs or whatever, that gets translated onto a map. And you can also add a layer of time to it. So people who access the map will know that during a particular time, this street in London smells like such and such. And likewise for sounds. So with this, you have an innovative soundscape and smellscape of a city. Tracking telecom. Of course, with telecom, you probably need to have special permissions or uh, collaboration with the network carrier. And these days, literally, when you track cell phones, you are tracking the movement of people because everyone has got a phone. Green cover and landscape data. I think we all would have taken Google Earth images and picked out the green color in Photoshop and you know tried to calculate the green cover. But uh, MIT's Sensible City Lab had a different approach to this. They wanted to know the green cover from the perspective of the pedestrian. And not they are not interested in satellite images, so they took uh, Google Street Maps, sorry Street View, and hacked into that, they did a lot of coding to hack into it and take it frame by frame, sample the green color and calculate the percentage of green cover along a street as a pedestrian would see it. And they've done this for various cities around the world. You should actually definitely look at MIT Sensible City Lab website because there are lots of projects of big time. Topographical data that can be got through infrared photos, high quality, satellite images from uh, NASA or USGS website, uh, LIDAR data or uh, LIDAR is a 3D scan, right? So that kind of image will help you obtain a digital elevation model when you bring it into a 3D platform like Rhino. Easily you can get a, a point cloud and generate a surface over it and you have your uh, topographical model in its, all its 3D glory. So here I've taken uh, some data from Hong Kong and uh, done a 3D model of the topography and overlaid it with the building uh, footprints. So I just wanted to see what kind of buildings have been built on steep slopes. On the right, you can see elevation versus density. I've overlaid the population density map over the elevation map to know what the population might be on steep slopes. 
So moving on to analysis uh, tools. Again, sticking with uh, topography, there are uh, infinite ways. Once you get your 3D model in, you can in, uh, you can do various kinds of analysis like slope analysis, um, slope aspect analysis, another uh, important way of analyzing topography, where you where it calculates the the direction in which the slope is facing in. Because in mountainous regions, sometimes a slope might face the north or northeast part, and it might not get enough sunshine sunshine during large parts of the year. Another one is hydrological analysis that you do on a digital elevation model or topographical model. Uh, there are tools in ArcGIS and also plugins within Grasshopper that help you uh, simulate the water runoff, surface water runoff from uh, the terrain. You can also do a watershed analysis. This is super critical because it gives you the area of the terrain which drains into a particular drainage channel or into a particular reservoir. By that, with that, you can know if the reservoir is big enough to handle flooding situations. Can is it safe to build around it? Uh, do you need to avoid certain drainage channels where there might be excessive water flow? Uh, all this is uh, closely linked to landscape and ecology, and this has to be associated with the urban fabric while we design. Climate and environmental analysis is something we all would have done. Uh, calculating the solar exposure on buildings is quite a common practice, but it is equally important to calculate the solar uh, exposure and solar insulation at street level as well for open spaces. If a plaza is too big, it might uh, be a heat sink in itself. Uh, does it uh, do narrow streets that are lined with the buildings? Do they receive enough sunlight or are they in shade during most parts of the year? Like that kind of a street might be. Uh, an advantage in a city like Dubai where it's super hot. Uh, so all that kind of analysis is uh, is important to do and environmental and climatic tools will help you do that. There are lots of uh, plugins available within Grasshopper environment to do this kind of analysis. So analyzing wind comfort, now this can be tricky because uh, computational fluid dynamics is a really heavy task. You need a really good computer or some expensive software to do that. But it is important to know pedestrian wind comfort in urban spaces, for example, near tall buildings or groups of buildings. Sometimes wind vortexes might be formed or in an urban canyon where it's a narrow street with tall buildings on either side, wind can get really accelerated and all this will cause uh, an uncomfortable environment uh, at the ground level. Now, talking about urban metrics, it is all about quantifying various aspects of the city because this is needed, hard numbers are needed to set up our objectives when we go on to generate uh, the design. So as far as networks are concerned, space syntax is uh, something called space syntax, which relates the movement of people, the street segments, junctions, and land use. And uh, street space syntax has been in practice since the 1970s when uh, Hillier and Hansen from the Bartlett School in London, they proposed this theory. And there are many measures of network uh, of a network that this theory proposes. It's a huge topic in itself and it's super uh, useful in optimizing street networks. For example, the image on the left has something called betweenness analysis. To put it simply, uh, let's say there's an urban patch and there's this uh, street network and there are buildings uh, along that street. So for users, if users from every building, starting from that building and going to a common destination, say the metro station, and let's assume they take the shortest path to get to the metro station. All of these users or all the people might be using certain segments of the network more commonly than other segments. So, so one is the main street or the main uh, road itself might be extensively used, but there might be other segments of the network which are equally useful. So if I'm a business owner and I want to set up my shop or a uh, bakery somewhere, I would actually you uh, put it along a smaller segment of the network, which is highly used. So it can has so many implications on placing buildings, land use, uh, to make that particular uh, segment of the network wider to accommodate the extensive use. So there are multiple uses of uh, this kind of analysis. The image on the right is network integration, where if you are uh, designing a small part of the city, how integrated is your network? and compared to the larger city. 
and this kind of a network analysis, there are tools which help you do it on the fly. So while you generate the street network, it can calculate these uh, analytical measures and give you the results so that you can uh, you know, optimize your street uh, network as you generate it. Another useful uh, network measure is in space syntax is the service range or reach analysis. It basically tells, uh, helps you in placing public transport stops or amenities in places where there are the maximum number of residents around it within a defined walking radius. We all would have seen that circle that we place, right? The five minute walking circle with the radius of around 500 meters. So that is just a straight line measure of 500 meters. Whereas here, it literally calculates the street length uh, from the public transport stop to every building along the network route. And it can also calculate the service range of say a police station needs to service uh, maybe 500 plots around it. So it can easily ca calculate every uh, service ranges, the range of every service or amenity. Spatial quality is something that is really difficult to quantify. So there are certain urban metrics to help you with that as well. For example, sky view factor will calculate the uh, percentage of sky that is visible between the buildings when you look up. And then if you want to uh, quantify the quality of an urban space, like an urban plaza or something, there are things like uh, measures like enclosure value or porosity, which will help you do that. Then there's view shed analysis, which is important because if the designer deems it important that some landmarks need to be visible from various parts of the city or from various public spaces, those public spaces can be given a better scope. And the same can be assessed for buildings as well. So buildings that have uh, better views of the surroundings get a better score. And all of this helps you in setting up objectives for generative design. Now, moving on to predictive because Sometimes it needs coding. Prediction modeling is basically a function of time. There will either be growth in the system or there might be regression in the system. For example, even today, mathematicians are trying to calculate when the peak COVID cases might occur and when regression might start. So they have to deal with tons of complex data like movement of people, climate, sample scenarios in other countries, etc. It's similar, it's as complex if you want to uh, predict how an urban system might grow. So you have mathematical models like L systems, or if you want to uh, simulate organic growth like uh, physarium using um, movements which mimic fungal um, organisms, uh, you have ways of doing that as well. Now, mathematical modeling, I know architects, most of us are not really good at maths, myself included. But we can always use equations and mathematical techniques developed by experts and scientists. So this is from my thesis where uh, we tried to calculate the erosion from the hillsides. So there's this uh, universal soil loss equation that we uh, studied about. And every, um, every variable in the equation is obtained from these six maps. And apart from that, we also need to calculate the location or the distance from every point on the topography to the nearest drainage channel. So all of this data along with these variables and these uh, drainage lengths is synthesized to get the soil loss equation. And our objective was to minimize the soil loss equation with the appropriate land use pattern. So I'll be talking about this more when I'm presenting my thesis later on. Then the cellular automation which is part, uh, also uh, a part of mathematical simulation. This is a very specific software that uses cellular automation to calculate water flow. Like I initially taught, uh, spoke to you about uh, computational fluid dynamics and how computationally heavy that is. Cellular automation might get, make it slightly easier because it's a low risk method of doing fluid dynamics. So we use this to simulate landslides in our thesis. So it is not technically uh, a landslide simulation. It is more water flow, which induces erosion and where that erosion is deposited in the 
where the erosion is deposited, which might create a landslide. So this is uh, where I was talking about how some low risk softwares that we as architects can use with a laptop rather than having some expensive um, landslide simulation software that uh, geotechnical engineers use and you probably need a supercomputer to do that. So these are low risk uh, simulation tools. Another uh, such tool is agent based simulation, which is usually used to generate networks. But you can also mimic collective intelligence found in fishes and birds, which is called swarm behavior. And if you use that innovatively, it can be a design driver as well. Pedestrian simulation or crowd simulation is usually done to mimic uh, large groups of people from a start point to various destination points. The scan also gives some gener uh, emergent behavior. You can toggle the uh, you can toggle the variation in movement of people, their, uh, uh, what do you say, their ability to stall during movement. And all of this uh, will be useful to analyze if spaces are big enough to accommodate sudden changes. So if there is an evacuation from the building or from, say, a stadium, where do people go? How big might the refuge space needs to be to accommodate such activities? The image on the right is a tower project by Con Pedersen Fox in New York. Such simulations are also useful in the real world to negotiate with the builder and the city council. So although the builder might be within his rights to build to maximum ground coverage, if through such simulations, if he is convinced to give up the ground level for urban activity or for a public space, the city council might allow him to build premium FSI or to build taller. Okay, finally, getting to the last part of our, uh, of our presentation, generative tools. It is essential to know the process of optimization when you're talking about generative tools. Multi-objective optimization is, where, is uh, where there are conflicting objectives and the genetic algorithm tries to find the most balanced solution that uh, performs well in all objectives. Genetic algorithms are usually based on Darwinian princi uh, evolutionary principles. So you will find words like uh, phenotypes, gene pool, um, mutation, breeding, so, and you find these genetic algorithms within Grasshopper as well. There are uh, quite a few tools like Octopus, Wallasei, or Galapagos, which will help you do that. And you should, when I'm talking about the most balanced solution, the most fittest phenotype, it is really a myth because no one solution can score 100 out of 100 in all objectives. That's really, uh, might be possible, but it's really rare, and you really do not need to look for that fittest solution. Rather, designers' responsibility is to pick and choose few of the top performing solutions and analyze it further. So there might be solutions which perform really well in one objective and perform badly in one or perform average in the others. So if we pick and choose five, top five or top ten, now we can then analyze it for further uh, objectives and uh, the designer can use his intuition to pick and choose. There's also the designer's responsibility to define these quantifiable objectives because I've spoken quite uh, intensively about the urban metrics and how we need to have quantifiable or numbers to be able to set up our objectives. And that is what is need to be done. And you know, from solar gain views, the variety in urban form, courtyard sizes, project costs, all of these, and you can have a multitude of. Uh, opposing objectives and the genetic algorithm will help you and find the top performing uh, solutions. So now that you have an idea about multi-objective optimization, I'll briefly show you an alternative method of generating uh, cities, which is called shape grammar. So shape grammar is usually a computer uh, science term and it is used mostly in hard coded programs. So here it is used in city engine where you, if you see the images on the left, you can uh, define a few of the street networks. You can find, you can define, say, origin points uh, of city clusters. You can even give a sample, um, <coughs> sample tissue of a city, like some fine-grained uh, example or a post-grain example if you want large buildings. You can give examples of uh, building morphology that you want this computer to generate. You can even give give it um, an urban growth pattern, and all of it will be taken into account 
to generate uh, auto autonomously by the city engine or any other program. Downside is the designer has almost no control over it once the generation or the uh, tool starts generating. So one such example is this uh, PhD thesis done at the AA, where uh, this person he took low density tissue of less, uh, West London to generate uh, lower residential units, or he took uh, medium density tissue as a sample uh, tissue from Tokyo and he used it to generate a dense uh, urban patch. Okay, so that's that. Now, moving on to uh, how one would procedurally generate an integrated urban morphology. This is important to know what the elements of urban morphology are. So what are we trying to generate layer by layer? Here I've just added uh, these layers. It's not in any order of priority, but in broadly, these are the uh, various layers of urban morphology. Number one, human activity and human interaction. Like when I was talking about big data, this is what it tracks, right? Human activity and human interaction. What is the purpose for humans to occupy that land? Why do they move from one place to the other? Is it for profession? Is this uh, design going to be a university town? Is it an industrial area? All that has implications on human activity and that will have implications on consequent layers as well. Number two is uh, street networks. I've already talked a lot about street networks. For generating main streets, secondary and tertiary streets will divide the land into land parcels, which is what the third layer uh, third layer is about. Land parcels, whether you want fine grain urbanism in one patch, coarse grain, etc. Number four, terrain and ecology. It's again, super important. Time and again, this layer has been ignored during urban plan planning, and we suffer the consequences. Every year, we see in monsoon that it's either flooded or during the summers it is. Uh, we have a drought because the water and the, equal, uh, the natural flows is not finding its way to where it's supposed to go. Number five is land use. Number six is building morphology. This is a 3D shape of your city, the shape or the form that your uh, buildings will need to take. Now, this is the general workflow for a procedural method of urbanism. So once the data analysis is done, the script here is where you show your skills as a designer. The script needs to be uh, flexible and robust at the same time to generate these various elements. And if you do it well, you will notice some emergent behavior and it will take its own form and it will surprise you in many ways. Uh, all of this need uh, objectives to be compared to. So the objectives need to be clearly uh, defined so that the optimization can take place uh, properly. And if you notice here that I've, I've shown as if all of these layers are generated simultaneously and then you take forward the best performing solutions for further analysis. But in reality, if you want to generate so many layers together along with so many parameters, you would need a supercomputer to do that. So it is more common practice to find a sequential flow of generation. So you do one layer at a time according to your priority and uh, then subsequent layers will follow what has been uh, generated previously and, and so on and so forth. And then finally, you can analyze your uh, overall urban morphology and take it forward. It is almost like a recipe where the designer can change the order and weightage of the ingredients to get varying results. In other words, it's an algorithm, but I've been consciously trying to avoid the term algorithmic or parametric organism because of certain negative connotations associated with it. Uh, you know that it needs to have a certain kind of aesthetic. So all of these images shown here are from Zaha Hadid Architects, but I know I'm quite sure that uh, you know, they too would have followed a procedural method and a generative rigor to get these designs. So there are good and bad things about uh, such designs. Bad being that the aesthetic may take precedence over other objectives. The good is that even though we rarely draw a line manually in this approach, this design shows that with the right script, the designer can still imprint his or her signature on the final design. Right, moving on to the case studies. So the first case study is a design of a single building, one Vanderbilt Tower in New York City by KPF. 
uh, where one building can have urban implications and how these are uh, translated as objectives and how the building is generated. So you have client objectives like it means the building needs to have good views from and towards the building. It will have city and community objectives like pedestrian views, the right of light at street levels, the right of light to neighboring buildings, pedestrian flow in and around the site. So all of these uh, objectives are first tested. So the general uh, approach here for architectural uh, building, architectural uh, form finding is you can test certain design languages first. So you, they are testing some box reforms, uh, some really curvilinear forms, this kind of a tapered, chamfered form. And once they know which form might perform better in this context, they'll take that forward. So it's clearly seen uh, from this dashboard that this particular tapered form is performing better than the others, and they are taking it forward. They'll do many more iterations of this tapered form to get the exact angle of taper, what the height of the building should be, et cetera, et cetera. Also do note how neatly this uh, dashboard is set up. If you want to present your design to other stakeholders, uh, the data and the outputs, the scores are all neatly uh, displayed in this kind of a, a dashboard. It's called a dashboard. I've already shown you this. And once you get that tapered form, they have this envelope within which they are exploring various variations of tapering and uh, do it, analyzing it against spatial quality uh, metrics like sky view factor, et cetera, et cetera. So, so I wanted to show you one example, which is about procedural non-optimized method of generation, generating design. So although the script uh, is again an associative script, there are associations between the layers, you change one, there are, has implications on the others. There is no uh, optimization sta stage as such. Just wanted to play this video, it's quite self-explanatory. Do check out uh, this website called Decoding Spaces and so Future City Labs in uh, Singapore and ETH Zurich. So here he's defining the main street and the uh, orientation of the secondary street grid. That street grid could be in response to wind direction. And if you notice that he has like a he has this kind of a sketch underneath. So this is almost like a top-down conventional urban planning where the analysis is done through sketches and he's marking out the public space. He's marking out green zones. The analysis was done in quite a conventional or analog way. And then the uh, consequent uh, generation is quite an adopt adaptive uh, script that he has going on. So he's doing the vegetation street layout is done. He is now forming a density gradient for the land use pattern. So he's once he draws on various layers, the script will take it into account and start. And the script also has uh, inherent development control rule, control rules for every plot and every kind of a land use zone. Once the land use is done, the buildings are generated according to those uh, development control rules like setbacks and uh, building maximum building heights, what the FSI needs to be for every land use, etc. So, so on and so forth. So you can see that he is manually now adjusting every layer to be able to generate various designs on the fly and to be able to assess the objectives on the fly. But there is no optimization as such. So that is one example. Case study number three is uh, the generation of an urban block in London, again done by KPF, where they studied existing uh, housing blocks uh, in London. Housing blocks in London could vary between 100 meters or so, 100 by 100 meters. And they took these blocks and their intention was to densify it further, to create a high density version of an existing block. So the cool thing about the evolutionary process 
evolutionary processes is that in generative design, once you have a sample and you set up the objectives to come close to that uh, sample building or sample urban patch, then you get variations that have similar traits to the original one. So although the new London block that they are proposing might be quite different to look at, might be taller, it will still have the same uh, open space hierarchy. It will still have those quality urban space qualities that you sampled from that they sampled from the original block. So they've now um, arranged uh, multi multiple blocks side by side and try to generate a larger urban patch. And finally, KPF it didn't stop at generating, uh, you know, computer generated designs of the urban block. Here, they've actually studied the top performing solutions of the uh, generations. And here, the, uh, their urban designers are now taking control from the computational designers. We also, as designers, need to do this, that we can't stop at what the computer gives us. In computational design, you need to go further. We need to analyze what the top solutions are. And here, they are forming rules that they then propose to the uh, London Council uh, for this kind of a new uh, version of the London housing block, which is more dense. Okay, here is my thesis project that was done during my master's. Three of us worked on it. So this thesis was on uh, urban intense urbanization towards hillsides and how that depletes natural resources and how it might uh, trigger negative uh, trigger landscapes or landslides or other hazards that might happen in uh, critical or sensitive terrains. So our urban um, test site was in Shenzhen in China. And our intention was to integrate various ecosystems of the existing hillside with the dense urban patch that we are proposing. So from the outset, ours was uh, an ecological, ecologically or landscape prioritized uh, approach to urbanism. So our site was slightly outside the city in this mountainous region. Uh, where there used to be urban farming or terraced farming happening decades ago, but now it's all been urbanized and the urbanization is slowly climbing up the mountain. So there might be uh, danger of uh, triggering landslides and other haz hazards in this uh, sensitive terrain. So the research question was how to synchronically develop a city tissue focusing on the relationships between hill sub ecosystems and establishing a fertile environment suitable for the coexistence of urban activity with natural phenomena. This was our final output, what we set out to do, and let's see how we got there. This I've already shown you before, how we generated the land use map based on the uh, soil loss equation. We took various risk analysis maps beforehand the structural uh, stability of the soil, the factor of safety to build, what, what can be built in which part of the mountain, the elevation of the soil, uh, the slope aspect analysis, slope angle, erosion and deposition impact that came from the simulations, soil depth and soil type analysis. So all of these maps have been synthesized along with the mathematical modeling to generate the land use map. And our objective was to, of course, like I said, reduce erosion and reduce the impact or uh, reduce the threat of landslides while at the same time increasing the density of buildable area. So these are conflicting objectives, right? You want to build more at the same time, you want to reduce the risk of landslides. And at the same time, you want to also uh, reintroduce urban farming as a method of stabilizing slopes. So terrace farming or rice farming is uh, has been a slope stabilization measure for many decades, many hundreds of years actually. And here you can see the layers or the various elements of our urban morphology in our uh, prioritized uh, manner. So this is sequentially how we went about generating each uh, layer. And like I said before, ours was an ecologically 
uh, prioritized urbanism. So our hydrological network, farming and vegetation took precedence over the urban strategy. When you're talking about hydrological network, we know that, that there are certain uh, natural drainage channels coming down from the mountain and they form the main reservoirs in the valley. So when we did the uh, optimization of the hydrology and the network of, we wanted to create a network of smaller urban reservoirs along the mountain, which would store water for a short amount of time to reduce the rate of flow down to the reservoirs. So that way you can avoid flooding during peak rainfall season. So this was the final uh, network of reservoirs and uh, wetland areas around those reservoirs to filter the water, store water and reduce the rate of flow. Then we have uh, farming ideas because like this um, basically being an urban farming patch, this is what we talked about. I talked about when I said human interaction being a layer or an element of urban morphology. So the purpose of humans to settle here would be to have to settle in this dense uh, urban patch and do farming at the same time. Then there's vegetative uh, strategy. And then when you talk about networks in a hillside, we used agent-based uh, systems to define paths on a certain defined gradient. So if a one in 20 is the gradient where we can walk comfortably, we used agent-based methods to figure out uh, the best route from point A to point B along a slope. And then we had uh, one in eight or one in 15 for other streets. So here from every cluster, we, we had this urban agent-based analysis to simulate uh, networks between them as a walkable network. And then we had vehicular and uh, other main networks connecting the uh, urban patches as well. That was our network strategy. And the urban strategy, I just played this video, it's quite self-explanatory. Um, because we were working on a five square kilometer patch, it's quite a huge area to generate uh, buildings and urban morphology. So we kind of zoomed into a smaller patch. So we had various clusters of urban patches along the mountain. We are now focusing on a smaller urban patch and how to generate plots, networks, and public spaces along that patch. We took into account the urban activity. We took into account the initial landscape, uh, sorry, land use map, where uh, we knew that there would be three types of densities, low density, mid density, and high density building area. And once these plots were generated, they were tested against uh, drainage flows, and if the street networks can dive, divert those uh, water flows into the nearest natural drainage channel. Sorry, the bus. Let it play. So at every stage, there was an optimization stage. We would select certain fittest criteria, fittest solutions, and analyze it further, and take it forward to the next stage of uh, generation. So once the plots were generated, it was optimized, tested against flow, tested against surface flow. And then it was tested against availability of public space and the integration of the network. And when we got to the building types, we had three basic building types that were uh, uh, adapted from uh, traditional build, uh,
Ayo para lalas. Uh, we just have a small technical glitch here. Give us a couple of minutes to just sort it out. As uh, Ashad is restarting the system and uh, joining us, in, I request all the participants to just uh, send in their questions if they have any at the moment to us personally, so we can ask them at the end of the session as well. I think we need another couple of minutes for. Sorry, I'm really sorry here. about this, but yeah, 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 my net connection does this time and again. My apologies. Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. We can hear you now. Yeah, let me share my screen. I think I need your permission to do that. Nitesh, I'm unable to share the screen. It, it seems to say you are offline. Can you disconnect and get back again? Okay. Disconnect from this and come back again. Are you able to see the screen? Yeah, yeah, go on, go on. Okay, let's resume. I'm sorry again. So those various uh, types of building forms were again uh, object sorry, optimized to various objectives. And it's important to note that those building forms came from certain sampled uh, traditional building forms. So once generated or populated across the patch, you have something of a, a sampled urbanism uh, that is rooted in context, but it's generated uh, individually and integrated with the landscape. So you have various layers now already generated as forests, terrace farming networks, operational public spaces, and the built fabric. Here is a section across the site. And this is what we managed for a five square kilometer urban patch.
So once that urban patch was generated, we analyzed it further with space syntax methods uh, to know where to place certain amenities, uh, certain uh, public transport stops, and how to make it more into a holistic urban design. And that was the last of my academic projects that I did back in 2017. Credit should go to to two of my two teammates, Diego Valdivia and uh, Shashalu as well. Finally, I think we have time for some more uh, projects, Nitesh. Yeah, I think you can go on, go on for the 10 minutes. So let me show you some of my going work at Node Studio, which is at an urban realm. So I've uh, been drafted in as an urban designer, as an architectural consultant slash urban designer for uh, larger firms like l and who, who have taken up the role as the lead consultant in projects such as this one in Pune, where there's a BRTS station proposed at an elevated level. It's bad enough that uh, if a BRTS is proposed at the ground level, we might not have enough space because of our pathetic uh, pavement and public space kind of pedestrian conditions at the ground level. But how does one reach the elevated level in order to access it? Will there be enough uh, space to provide vertical transportation to get there? Uh, there needs to be a refuge space before getting to the middle of the elevated highway and access the BRTS. So it's always uh, thought of as an elevated street, a concourse level, where you take a lift or a staircase to an elevated street level. And my agenda has always been to integrate quality public space at various scales, even in uh, public projects or public infrastructure projects. So here is a view of that concourse level where um, the public space has been um, kind of a unique um, approach to defining a public space in a, within the uh, urban infrastructure project, even by segregating the circulation area from, say, the kiosks and the commercial areas, you can have um, areas where people can take refuge before uh, taking the lift or the staircase to the uh, BRTS station. The view of the BRTS station. And then this is another project in uh, Kerala. This is actually a cable state bridge in uh, northern Kerala in Malapuram district. It spans 300 meters across um, an estuary. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and I was brought in to work on the form of the bridge itself and the urban area, associated urban areas like the parks on either side. Uh, and this particular bridge had to be special. Basically, it just came from higher up the ministry, that the ministers and the speaker of the Kela Legislative Assembly wanted this to be a signature bridge that will have certain urban quality to it, certain, how they put it was certain tourism potential. For me, tourism potential is translated as quality urban space for the locals and uh, visitors alike. So how we sold it to them was we proposed 50% of the bridge to be dedicated for pedestrian plaza. And the projection was that as of now, it's only two lane road is enough, but say 30 years down the line, the traffic requirement would mean that it needs to be expanded to a four lane road. So we told them that let's have 50% as of now for vehicles and 50% for pedestrians. Maybe 30 years down the line, let's see if the needs change. And then we also proposed a lower deck, which could be used as a cafe or a fishing spot. Um, so the ministry were uh, open to such new ideas and it's been approved and it's gone on to tender stage. So having an intensely pedestrianized and landscaped area, landscape thoroughfare on a vehicular bridge is quite a rare feat and it's been well received as of, as of now. So here I've proposed a cycle lane, white pedestrian plaza, and really deep uh, planter boxes, which are doubling up as benches. These planter boxes are deep enough to plant mature trees as well. So landscaping on a bridge has been seen before in pedestrian bridges at the most, but this kind of uh, large scale landscaping on a vehicular bridge is unheard of. 
And finally, I was also working on the structure of the bridge as well to make it more aesthetically pleasing, working with the structural engineers to integrate uh, the form with the structure. You have the uh, floating uh, deck level at a lower level that can be accessed via a staircase uh, down to the cafe level. So all of this, you know, I'm still not an urban designer per se in the conventional sense of the word. I'm still very much an architect, but with a heavy bias towards urbanism. So that is how my current work is shaping up. Thanks a lot for tuning in. And that is that. Sorry again for the internet screw up in the middle. Nanitish? Yeah. Take uh... question. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Arshad. Uh, for those who don't know Arshad, I have known him personally for almost uh, 20 years now, I guess. Almost uh, we were batchmates at uh, SAP and uh, we worked on a couple of projects together as well. So Arshad has always been passionate about uh, digital architecture and the role of, uh, uh, role of uh, digital architecture in today's context as well. So he's been passionate about it for the last I would say we've seen him do this from uh, his thesis project, I guess, at SAP it was uh, an architectural project. Uh, uh, am I right, Ashish? Was it a, a building for automa automa autom yeah. automation? Or? Yeah, automobiles, yeah, but it was a process driven approach. Yeah, Yeah. the site was, uh, we remember the site was also the uh, Tidal Park phase two site that's, uh, yeah. that's built into a into an IT park now. Quite an interesting project in 2011, I guess, and it was something new for all of us to uh, see that happen. And this passion has uh, driven him to extend a master's program in uh, ABA with Emerging Technologies, which is completely focused on uh, on technological development and uh, using uh, uh, tools to generate uh, uh, generate today's uh, design drawings and stuff like that. So it's quite a unique program at the A and quite a few of these uh, international uh, offices use these uh, uh, tools today to generate uh, cities and the new buildings that you come across all over the world. So those are, uh, so, and and on those lines, we have a couple of questions as well, like uh, from Ashwat Kumar as well, like he wanted specifically to understand which softwares do you recommend as beginners or uh, as students and uh, recent graduates to start uh, learning so that they can also benefit from this and uh, utilize them in their uh, in their uh, practice. Also, similar question from uh, Sotif, which is also, which tools have you used for these simulations, like, uh, in a way? Okay, the second question first, which, the question coming from, about the, which tools have I used for what kind of simulations? Is it talking about specifically about my thesis project or? Uh, specifically for your, your thesis project, because that's the one I think you must have used specifically. Yeah, yeah so project. my thesis project, some of the simulations was done in, some of the geological simulations was done in a software called Cesar. Cesar is that computer, uh, what is that? A cellular automata software that generate or uh, that simulates water flow and uh, erosion and deposition uh, behavior. So since we could not get our hands on something even more advanced, like there are tools, uh, there are simulations that uh, engineers use to generate landslides, to model landslides, to model even tidal behavior, uh, literally moving every single particle on the waves to, or about how a soil would uh, flow down the mountain or how a mud, mud slide would happen. These are really advanced and computationally heavy softwares that you need to either buy and you need a really good computer to run it on. So ours was more of a, a rough or a low res approach to this. So that's why we used uh, Cesar. That was one of the geological softwares that we used. Apart from that, for water flow simulation that could have, that we needed to test our uh, buildings as we generated it, all of that happened within the grasshopper environment. So tools like Kangaroo, which is a physics, physics engine. Uh, there's another tool called, um, I think it's called Sonic, which can uh, predict or which can be used to mimic water flow, surface water flow. So those were some of the tools. And apart from that, 
large part of our land uh, land use map was generated with mathematical modeling right i told you about how we use that equation to generate the uh, land use map so those were tools specific to my thesis and then to answer the first question about uh, what tools can students start with like i said you need to have a cat platform of your liking so rhino grasshopper was my preferred cat platform where you can import uh, information and geometry from other softwares as well. So I think Grasshopper is a very flexible and a versatile tool for generative design. So once you start learning that, you might uh, start to learn even about, you know, other specific plugins within Grasshopper, which you might find useful as and in, as in when you need it, you might learn about uh, uh, structural optimization using Karamba uh, or uh, physics uh, modeling using Kangaroo plugin and some of these uh, space syntax, if you are working on an urban project, you will want to import, you will want to install that plugin. So start with Rhino Grasshopper and slowly you will build your uh, knowledge on other plugins as well. Okay. Uh, following on to the similar question as well, like uh, there's a question from Michael Lee, who's a professor at uh, Minachi College. Like how yeah. different are these platforms, uh, mm. uh, Rhino CAD, Mm. How different are these from uh, the ArcGIS platform, like in terms of uh, what are the major differences that you find if you have used on both those platforms? So ArcGIS uh, is of course, it's an amazing platform to map information onto like at a 2D level. Also at a 3D level, I think you can do it. Uh, but that is basically a mapping software. You can't really generate design. It's not a design software, right? You need to then name kind of integrate that information with something you're doing uh, in your 3D modeling environment. So that's where that link happens in that very first slide, first few slides that I showed you where you have your data sets within ArcGIS and uh, other uh, softwares. And then you, you need to bring that in, import that into a 3D software to be able to manipulate it and integrate it into your design uh, process. So, but yeah, definitely ArcGIS is something if you are into urban design primarily or urban planning, ArcGIS is an amazing uh, source of information. Okay. Uh, following on, uh, mm. the question continues as, can we work with landscape metrics on uh, CAD or Rhino platform as well? Sorry, I didn't get you. Can, can, you, work on, uh, can you work with landscape metrics mm -hmm. uh, on CAD or Rhino platforms? What is meant by landscape metrics? Like, not fully understanding that. Mm, I guess. Uh, I think I think it's similar to your urban metrics that you have. Uh, yeah. It must be something so on similar lines. Point, yeah. So that is something that you need to research on. Like, are there metrics for uh, landscape specifically? Uh, are there quantifiable uh, aspects of landscape? I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, if anything can be converted into numbers that can be manipulated as data and used in various ways uh, in, in design. Okay, I think uh, I think you answered those questions. But then one of my questions would be like yeah. in terms of the time frame that we would uh, require. Like maybe a question all the students will also want to understand like a time frame on in layman term. Mm -hmm. How long do you think would it take for a project of this scale or a small scale of on an urban scale project? How long do you feel it will take for a student to what kind of time frame do you? That's a tricky one to answer because uh, depending on the depth of analysis required, sometimes at academic level you might end up doing a lot more analysis than required because of, you have like six months to do your thesis or whatever. But at the same time, if you're working at an office, uh, you might not have that much time to analyze one single project and work on it in so much detail. Um, mm. so it kind of varies. You might have to do quick and dirty work in offices sometimes. Um, and tools like Grasshopper, I know, all help in doing that. Uh, because it is kind of a low risk method, uh, you might do quick analysis, you might do a quick generation, like uh, probably that uh, tower project by KPF was done quite quickly. I don't think you would have yeah. spent uh, more than two weeks on it, at least the initial concept part. Uh, 
so you can develop hundreds of options, scroll through them, select, analyze it, and optimize it further within a say a two week period for a small uh, an architectural project or a small scale urban project. The same one, if you are taking it for a much larger scale, you want to do a yeah. lot more uh, environmental analysis, ecological analysis. You might have to bring in experts from other fields as well uh, to do that. Some geologists, complexity scientists to you know confirm your work and all that. It's a much longer process. Yeah. yeah. So I think you put it very well during the presentation. The difference between analog and digital, like uh, the mm -hmm. way we treat the conservative way of design maybe you can call it analog and uh, mm -hmm. design which is helping you in generating and making your work much more uh, uh, much more uh, confirmative i would say of the realities uh, make it maybe maybe you call it digital uh, so those skills mm -hmm. possibly are are extremely important skills that we need to understand during this uh, time as well like we we live in a digital age where uh, things keep changing quite drastically. The parameters keep changing. So if you keep updating yourself, I guess it's an extremely important role that uh, digital architecture and computational design plays in today's world, at least because of the way the parameters are changing so drastically. It's so difficult for us to keep track of it at a manual or a conservative mm -hmm. approach to design as such. So I think uh, the way you put it across uh, is going to be extremely useful for all the all the participants as well and maybe the students of the fourth year final year level who are approaching their thesis projects uh, and you start talking about uh, quite a few students who start talking about parametric design in uh, in architecture and they come up with the same old concepts so really understanding the the way parametric design helps you in determining uh, uh, a better uh, city or a better building is extremely important to understand. I think the way you put this, I'm sure the participants would have made it. Uh, it would must have been very useful for them. We yeah, have another question. Yeah, yeah any other question. Yeah, so that was my observation. The, the other question now that we have is: Do you uh, how how do you choose the mathematical expression for generating the structure? Uh, by Ashwath, again, is there any specific way of doing it? Okay, um, structure is quite a broad term, like are you talking about buildings? For example, in the way we did our thesis, we had to uh, touch upon structure in terms of soil, soil stability. We needed to find out the uh, factor of safety of that particular soil type on that particular slope angle. So if uh, we needed to know if we load that, that uh, particular slope with a building or with a multi-story building, Will it cause a landslide? So we study, we did study structure in terms of soil there and how that soil type uh, will, has to be protected at that particular slope angle. So that was the kind of uh, st structural analysis we did for soil um, based uh, for our thesis at least. If you're talking about uh, structural analysis of uh, architectural structures. There are tools like Karamba, which will uh, analyze the uh, stiffness, which will analyze the tension and compression in, in various elements, discrete elements. So that is something to look at if you are interested in structural optimization. Right. Okay. Okay. I guess uh, I guess the questions go on on similar line of in terms of uh, what software you use and how do you start off from there. I think you've already answered those uh, the questions. I think uh, uh, I feel I feel I think we're getting similar yeah, questions the now. The thing was, uh, I hope the students understand that the tools can be categorized. That's why how I structured the presentation like that. Like you know, tools to analyze, to collect data, to predict, and, and to generate, and all that. So, so structural analysis, analysis software or tools will come under the analysis uh, category, right? So how would you yeah. implement that in your design process? Then you can just try to search for uh, tools that work within your 3D environment or your CAT platform. So if it is Rhino Grasshopper, I am sure there are tools to address every single analysis need of yours. All you need to go is go to grasshopper3d.com and just search for it. There are forums which talk about um, every single tool in detail. You can ask help. 
about uh, the creators of that tool, the tool about, I, I spoke to you about optimization, right? Like there's Gallopagos and there's uh, uh, Wallace I and Octopus, which you, which are used for uh, multi-objective optimization. Those are generic algorithms. One of the tools was actually developed by my tutor at the A. He was a, he was a PhD student at the time and Wallace I is currently being developed by him. So he, he actually takes uh, on questions. You can email him. Uh, you can ask uh, him questions and he will personally clear your doubts. So that is the kind of one-on-one -on -one interaction that you can have with creators of tools because it is an open source software, Grasshopper and all the other plugins. Uh, the creators are super in, uh, interactive in, with you in these forums and they will help you out in any way. So you start with one and when you get to those tools, you can ask questions on those forums and you will learn quite easily. Yeah. I guess the uh, passion drives you in terms of uh, if you have the passion for it and if you really have the uh, if you have the passion for it, you surely would get into that process as well. So we have another question yeah. from Hindu, which is again, uh, are there any softwares to analyze the historical context of a certain area? Like, is there anything specific to, because you talked about morphology and uh, you talked about how evolution, historical patterns also come up, mm -hmm. play important role. And how big a role does it play in the entire design process? Like, do you understand the placement of the of a neighborhood, uh, and then come up with those parameters? Or uh, to add on to this question, how what's the role of uh, a human mind in designing those and defining those parameters as well? Like, the computer plays its role, but the human yeah. mind plays the role of defining the parameters of history, exactly. evolution, yeah. patterns. So, how yeah. do you bridge that gap, and how do you bring them together in a way? Okay, I'll ask the second answer the second question first. The human mind, that's where I said uh, when you define the script, when you're writing the script or you know doing it in Grasshopper, for those who know Grasshopper is a visual scripting platform, right? So you don't need to write or code it in C sharp or Python language or something. You just need to uh, do it visually, script it visually. But therein lies the ingenuity of the designer. You the way you script it, you can take in n number of parameters and still work well, or you can have a very complicated script that might not give you proper results. So you need to practice, learn how to do that properly, and eventually you will do a good job in structuring your script properly. Uh, it's called a grasshopper definition, right? You need to define that script properly. Yeah. Uh, and if it's done well, your results will be good. You can analyze it, you can optimize it however you want. And again, touching on the human aspect, I told you that we don't really just take out what the computer gives us, right? The computer yeah. optimizes and it might give you certain um, optimal results, but it is up to the designer. It is his or her responsibility to take maybe five or 10 or how many ever solutions you want and analyze it further. You can even take five solutions and just take the pretty, select the prettiest one of them. It's up to you. So you don't need to rely on numbers when you get your final output. You don't need to always rely on numbers, although it is good to do that. Okay, answering the first question, it was about historical context, right? Like, okay, that's a really good question. So even in our thesis, um, we sampled a historical village in China, a traditional farming village in China, and we wanted to get certain um, sampling data from that. Um, so there are ways to do historical sampling in a computational environment. You, of course, need to model that village. I didn't show you that because that would have taken a long time to uh, do it, and I wanted to do it within, an, within one hour. Um, so there are ways to do that. I can maybe... Uh, share that link um, with you. Some we we'll share the link of my uh, thesis document later on. Um, so once you do that sampling, your further your uh, generative process is now focused on achieving those objectives of that sampled village. So my uh, low density housing uh, in that thesis project uh, was based on that two courtyard principle of a traditional Japanese house, but adapted to a slope context. So one courtyard, when it heats up, the other smaller courtyard at the back will be still in cool, uh, will be still cooled at the surface level because of closely spaced walls, and that will induce cross ventilation between the hot and the cold courtyards, 
all these principles were studied from a traditional village and adapted to our context. Similarly, the uh, hierarchy of public spaces in a village, is there um, you know, a large open space that people gather in? Are there smaller uh, public spaces at cluster level between various houses? Uh, do you want to create that kind of hierarchical public space and uh, environment in your design, uh, in your urban design? So you can study it and implement it uh, in your design as well. So that would be my way of translating for further generation. Is that clear? I think. I think I think it makes sense. I think it uh, makes a lot of sense in terms of uh, uh, it gives us that kind of opportunity and flexibility in choosing our parameters as well, right? Like in a way, we have that uh, specific to our project, specific to our context, we could uh, input the number of parameters that we want to uh, uh, want to use. Okay. So there's another interesting question that uh, we have is like, what would you, what would be your take on the influence of pandemics? Influence of pandemics and uh, one second, I just completed pandemic breakouts like the COVID nineteen situation and urban design in the near future. Will we use these as well? Like you said, you did mention that uh, researchers today are giving out uh, prog uh, progressions in terms of uh, data. So will yeah. we need to input that as well, like uh, in a future uh, design process? Any kind of data can be implemented in be adapted and manipulated to help you in design in the mix itself I don't, I don't know how directly it will be useful or how directly it can be implemented something to think about definitely uh, but what i uh, spoke about uh, about how scientists are uh, uh, complexity scientists are doing mathematical modeling to figure out uh, the regression and how this pandemic might grow or uh, when it will reach the peak that's a different thing uh, it's not directly related to design itself. Um, definitely something to think about. Um, yeah. If there is a data, I mean, uh, these um, apps and all are already, there are mapping which are the, uh, what do you say, containment zone where people tracing apps have already used, even in India and in South Korea, it was used much earlier, earlier on. Uh, I don't know, that is part of big data. How do you use that? Uh, to influence design, something to think about. I'm not really sure. Yeah. I think there's an observation come, come question from Tausif yeah. again, which says, can computational approach help us better plan for opening up of our cities in present context of COVID-19 and stuff like that? Do you see any examples where it can be applied as such? Uh, I'm sure there are ways of, uh, as you said, uh, inputting the data already available and start mapping it out so that we get a better idea of opening up of our cities as well. When you say opening up, you mean opening up from a lockdown, you mean something like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. something like that in layman's term, yeah. Yeah, I think that is, yeah, that is one way of using um, the, the, the data that has been mapped onto the data about containment zones, uh, use um, infected people, the tracing of the infected people, how do you uh, use that data to open up parts of the city which would be safe? That's something, yeah, that can be used to map which parts of the cities are safe to open up initially and in a sequential manner you can uh, work out how to open up the rest of the city as well. Yeah, I guess uh, I guess we're going to the end of the session in terms of uh, the questions and answers as well. Yeah. Yeah. Going on and on and on, with the, the, the topic is such an interesting uh, topic that people have hundreds of questions to ask as well. Anyone personally wants to ask any question to Arshad, I think he's surely going to be helpful in terms of uh, uh, you can approach him if you want to specifically understand about how computational design works and how can you apply those principles in your practice or, or in your research as well. So I'm sure he'll be available for it. Before I get to the end of the session, I would like to inform all the participants that it's been quite an interesting session for us as well this week in terms of understanding from yesterday's session of uh, understanding green buildings and sustainability and how do you, what's the need for uh, using uh, green principles in today's uh, uh, architectural life as well, as well the, the benefits that you achieve from that both in terms of uh, the government benefit and as well environmental benefits as well. So quite a few learning experiences for us for the last couple of days. And uh, there is gonna be a feedback 
feedback uh, form that's going to be sent to all of your emails. I hope all of you can fill those uh, feedback forms and send it back. Uh, and once you do that, uh, by end of the day tomorrow, I sh I'm sure all of you should receive your uh, your certificates as well, these certificates as well. Uh, and uh, please stay tuned to our uh, sessions because it's going to be a weekly session where we have a couple of uh, uh, speakers every week for the next uh, couple of uh, next three weeks, I guess, where you stay focused and stay uh, with us so that you can learn quite a few new things as well during these difficult times. Uh, I would like to thank Ashad to take his time and uh, effort in presenting to all of us. And I'm sure uh, all of you would have had a great learning experience. I would like to thank the participants as well to, uh, who attended uh, the session and uh, the organizing committee, uh, Pavitra Ma'am, Gautam Sir, Jalaja Ma'am, HOD, uh, Stanley Daniel, so, and uh, the entire family at MC for uh, supporting us and being part of this session. And uh, look forward to having you again next week. We'll send across another uh, set of emails uh, to register for the following uh, week and looking forward to having you all. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I think you're going to check the chat box here to get the link for the feedback uh, form. So you guys can directly go to the chat box and uh, click the links and make sure you send us the feedbacks. Thank you. See you all. So those who are still here, you need to just make sure that you have to follow our Facebook page as well and our YouTube uh, channel. If you want to find this uh, video again, it's going to be available on our YouTube channel, SOA and C. Feel free to watch it whenever you want. Thank you.